Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. This is our second Instagram Live. So we're trying this thing where we go live several Fridays. And we are just highlighting some amazing BRM pros and people doing great things in the birth community. And today we have Olga, and she's going to be chatting with us about epidurals and pushing during an epidural. So I think a lot of times people um, they think, oh, I, there's an epidural, so then everything goes out the window, and I just have to get on my back and push with my, you know, my standard knees to my elbow, elbows, and we want to share that maybe there's different, different opportunities. So, um, first of all, Olga, welcome. How are you doing today? Hi, Lindsay. Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Can you hear me well? I think I'm kind of we can hear you well. Um, our producer, Jonathan, if you could get the screen that's like on a delay to leave so I'm not distracted by seeing myself talk right after I talk. Yeah, sweet. Amazing. So yeah, we can hear you great. So yeah, just let us know like how, how, how are you doing? What's up? Um, so I'm good. I'm here in Boston. I'm a labor doula. I'm su I support women at birth and, and I also like to see them a lot prenatally so I can help them prep their body for the labor. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, so our topic today, um, you know, epidurals. So, um, you know, my, I myself, we were talking about this before we went live. Like I myself, my first birth, I remember, um, you know, I was like, oh, I want to do it with with no intervention. And but I didn't really have like a plan except like to power through. Um, and then when I hit transition or transformation, you know, that period between from, you know, dialing and effacing to pushing, which tends to be an overwhelming time for a lot of people. I asked for an epidural and like now looking back, as soon as it hit, as soon as I could like not feel anything anymore, I was already pushing. Like actually even before, before this, like it fully numbed me, I was already um, pushing. And so, you know, looking back, I wish I would have had some sort of check or something prior to, because they would have been like, oh, you're already 10 centimeters. Do you still want it? And, you know, I, I hadn't even thought of that. So that's one thing that I always want people to consider if they're like, oh, I feel like I just can't do this anymore, but I wanted to. So it's like, you know, doesn't always. And, and so then I was like, I remember very much, and this was almost 18 years ago now, but I remember um, I felt nothing. Like it was complete numb. And that's not everyone's experience, but I was fully numb. And so they had to look at the monitor and I had to look at the monitor in order to tell me when I was having a contraction in order for me to push. Um, so it was tricky. Um, and interestingly enough, that's the only birth I ever tore, right? And it makes sense because if you can't feel things, sometimes you might, and, and you're coached to push a certain way and you're in a position that's creating less space, like, of course, like it, it's going to be different. So, so what's your experience? I'm sure you've attended pushing with an epidural what do you see what helps what let's just let's chat about it yeah i feel like when especially when the woman having like a first baby they tend to get like really strong epidural and then it's kind of at the and then it's kind of plays this role like i don't feel anything i don't know what to do like and i'm at the pushing stage like what is happening and i've chatted with the woman who had like the second birth like a or second child and they they do it differently they don't use as much medication as they did at the first birth because it's kind of like they saying i don't know what to do and when i don't feel it i don't i don't understand what's happening and when they have a chance to like do it differently they use less medication and that then that helps them to understand like what is my body is doing? Maybe I can change something and what is happening. So like the medication, yeah, it's plays a huge role. And as less as you can use, like if you just been in a labor, like you said, for like 40 hours or something like long time and you need to rest. So you take the medication, like a epidural just to relax. And it's, I think it, it plays, um, it's beneficial for the nervous system to relax too and to kind of let go like okay now i can take a breath or I can rest or sleep and after this time like first usually like two first two hours it's really strong medication and then you can lower it down so and after two hours after you rest you can do something you can facilitate the movements or you can change the position or you can return like get this sensation of your body or like feeling of your body back and then continue to like push or like figure out what to do next yeah absolutely and, and i find that um 
you know, I, we, we see a lot of these different things online about like, teach how to push, like, this is how you push. Um, you know, like, and different, I always say like different situations require different strategies. And, you know, when we, we focus so much on teaching them the right way to push, we kind of miss a big piece of the puzzle, which as of course, you know, is like, what's going on with the pelvic floor? What's going on with the sacrotuberous ligament? What's going on with the, you know, the rotation of the pelvis and all these different things. And we, we think like, oh, if I just teach them the right pushing strategy, then it, 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 but, but in reality, like we need to consider what's going on in the body. And, and like you said, sometimes we do need to rest. Right. And if, you know, it's, if somebody has been in labor for 40 hours, like intervention, like medical interventions have their place, right? Like I've been to births where I believe an epidural saved the vaginal birth, right? Like it was like, we needed to relax. We needed to downregulate. And there was nothing like when you get to this point where someone just can't, like they're, they're moving from pain to suffering, right? They're moving to this place where they just, it's like, everything's up here and we're freaking out. Like, and there's nothing physiological or different things. We've tried all the things like sometimes an epidural is the thing. And we don't have to feel weird about that. I feel like there's this weird, like mommy wars, birth wars. It's like, you know, my first birth was a hospital birth with an epidural. My next three were home births. And I don't like judge my earlier self or I don't think my last ones were better. It's just like different births require different, different things. And it was also an evolution of me as a human, right? Of like, this is what I'm working towards and what I want doesn't mean that that's someone else's evolution. So I think, um, I think the birth world needs just a little more love and understanding to each other of like, Hey, we, these are tools. We know these tools have a lot more risks, right? Medical interventions do have more risks associated with them. Um, and we know that, you know, I'm a doula, so I'm not the one watching for those, right? Like the nurse, the doctor, midwife, they're, if you're getting epidural, they're going to do things like you need a bit, you know, a bag of fluids before, and you need all these different things. They need to watch your blood pressure, and that's something people should be informed on, but then also know like this is a tool. Um, and the uh, the last thing, this is why I think we, why I really want to dive in with you is, it doesn't mean that everything is lost, right? It doesn't mean you move from like I've been moving and my doula's been giving me hip squeezes and we've been flowing and we've been you know creating shape changes and and all of a sudden I get the epidural and and I've heard of doulas who are like, well, if they get an epidural, I leave. Or they like, like they don't need me anymore. What would you say to that? Like, how do we support someone with an epidural and how does it change? But how does it not change? Right? Yeah. I feel like, especially if you have an epidural, it's uh, like the dual support is needed that it's more, and it's more of the emotional support just to yeah. keep you back to this, like your flow state, even if you was planning to have unmedicated birth, but then you get in and you kind of like starting to doubt yourself. Oh, like I shouldn't be doing it. It's not yeah. with my plan. But then like, if you have a doula, it's, it's giving you this power to like, to continue because it's, it's your labor. It's, there's no, it's not a, like a marathon or something. You don't have to be like the first one or like, the the greatest one it's right. uh, it's your it's your journey and i think yeah. if you have a doula who can help you to get back to this flow state and continue like to offer the options for example if when if i'm in the labor and the and the woman like um having epidural but the baby is still kind of high or at the mm -hmm. mid pelvis usually where, this, where we see like a lot of um time the way the baby hang out I propose a lot of motion and I say like, we still have a lot of things to, we still can a lot of things to do. Like if you wanted to maybe rest first and then we can mm. get back to like this moving and help baby to rotate and get down. And then let's kind of give them, um, this like a light, I don't know, like a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, yeah, I can, I really wanted to do, like, I really want to participate in my, in my labor and, and like, just tell me what, what, what else can I do? Like, and, yeah, it will, it, it, it's always great. And I see a lot of positive changes in like in terms of the baby station, how it's moving. And like, even though she's just resting, I still can use the tools to like help the baby while she is resting, like to rotate or like just to move or to find more optimal position. And like, even though she's having a epidural doesn't mean like she just have to wait <laughs> until everything has happened by itself. That's true. And you know, um, I have to grab my pipe because it's like, 
you know, but like people think, okay, I've been moving and moving and moving. Now I've got an epidural. And what do they do? We tend to sit people on their backs like this. And so now it's gravity negative, right? Baby, if we're pushing on our backs, we are pushing against gravity just because of the shape of our pelvis and like, right. Our sacrum is pressed against the bed, so it can't move out of the way. And, um, the other thing is the, the birthing person now does not have movement, right? Like you can't, I've never seen a walking epidural. They call them walking epidurals. And I hear some in some locations, anyone listening to this, let us know if this is a thing where you live, where I live. If you have an epidural, you cannot leave the bed. You cannot feel your legs. You, you cannot move. Um, I've, I've had experience with that woman and having the walking epidural. It's really? great. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, where, just, where I am, they, I think it must be less medication. So yeah, they it's still feel some. Medic- it's less opioid medication. So it's like a minimal amount of numbness, but you still don't feel the pain. Hmm. You know, so that's something for people to ask right ahead of time. If you're yeah, considering yeah, yeah. an epidural, see what the options are, where you live. Doulas tend to know pretty well, like the scene of where they attend births, like what are options at different places. Um, but here, like you get an epidural, you're done. But I have seen or done moving out of a bed, but I have seen just in the last, you know, like 18 years since I got one myself and even early in my doula career. So like 15 years ago, like, like way a while ago, epidurals were much denser. At least in my experience, I've noticed that as we've gone through the years, people still can feel a little bit like it's not as dense as it seemed to be. And sometimes we can get people onto a kneeling position, right? Like people think I can't kneel, Actually, a lot of people can kneel with epidurals. I've gotten people in Walters with epidurals. And actually, there was a birth. She was in labor. It was her first baby. She was in labor for many days. And and this baby, she's had four cents, so it's been a while. Um, But I remember very clearly because she had an epidural um, after a long labor. And her she was pushing and pushing and pushing. And we could see, like, like a little bit ahead, but no more. And every pushing effort, like strong, strong, hard. It was the coach pushing. Um, I said, Hey, can we try something? We flipped her over into Walters, um, which kind of my, my, that was actually the birth where I was like, Oh my gosh. And what it did was because people always tell me, Oh, Walters is a position to open the inlet. So why are you doing that during pushing Lindsay? And I realized, no, because the baby's shoulder if the baby's shoulders hung up here, even if we're seeing a little bit ahead, we need to open the inlet for a small amount of time, get the baby's shoulder under. Then we flipped her back onto kneeling, which of course she needed help, right? She couldn't get to kneeling on her own. And her baby was born in three contractions. So that's just to say, like, even though that wasn't a physiological birth, because, you know, there was a lot of medications on board, so it wasn't powered by, by, you know, the innate human capacity, it still was physiologically supported, right? So there's a difference between, like, the physiology doesn't go away, right? We're still, you know, birthing a human. We just have some different things on board that can make it trickier. Yeah, and I think I have a, I have a personal experience about, like, changing position and having the baby at the pushing stage. I was in, with my second labor. I was for, in the labor for, like, 40 hours. I wasn't exhausted because it was, like, um, easy labor. But, like, when I get to the pushing, I saw a lot of videos how the women are having their baby, like, in a tub, just, like, in a deep squatting position or on hands and knees. And I was trying that, but the baby was not coming out. And I'm like... I did all the thing and why it's not working. I'm like yeah. in this position, but it shouldn't. But then my my midwife moved my leg to this asymmetrical like lunge position mm-hmm. and I had my baby in the sec- next contraction. That's and I'm so like, cool. and for me, it was just like, then I asked her, my midwife, why did you change my like my leg to this position? She was like, it just was intuit- intu- intuitively. And now mm-hmm. we know like, because... Um, if we change the position of our like pelvis or in use gravitation, it helps to have the baby easier. And and my during my third labor, when it was really fast, as soon as I felt this urge to push, I immediately get to this position because I knew this is working for my body. And like yeah. because it was available to me based on my previous experience, I had my baby with like next contraction. She was born halfway with one contraction and I all the time when I'm working with my client I'm I'm making them to feel in their own body like this is the what's the no, what's usually done in a hospital when you lay on your back and you push with your knees to your chest but and try to try to like um 
I get them to stand in hands and knees and move different position and just imagine or feel your sits bones, how it's changing position. Do you feel like, is it bigger space? Like, do you feel like it's change? And when they see that, it's kind of like a light bump in there. It's like, wow, I really feel the difference. And, and, and they all, sometimes they ask me why, why is happening? Like why then every, every woman in the hospital just like labor in the back. And then I tell them that there is multiple position, even though if you're going to have an epidural, you still can be in more, um, in a better position and easier to have a baby. And like, that's the thing I was saying, like, try to keep moving, try to like yeah, explore the option. Yeah, I know. I think when we don't know our options, then we don't have any options. And a lot of people aren't given their options. They're told, like, do as you're told, basically. And I actually, you know, like, I love, you know, like, everyone's great. We're all trying to help birth, but we don't all see birth the same. And, you know, I remember I've been to births where, like, a provider will walk in. And actually, this one I remember, she was not doing anything weird. She was on her side, right? Gravity neutral, right? She's on her side pushing. The the OB walks in and he goes, well, she needs to be on her back. Otherwise, it's hard on my back. And I was like, yeah. and then versus, I have another story that just such polar opposites. I had a provider, um, uh, a midwife actually, walk into this hospital birth and the shirt she was wearing literally said, midwives do it in any position. And I was like, ah. And then I have another photo and this is a home birth, but I just, it was just so... I don't know. It just was, it just stayed with me of, there was this, this mom was hugging a birth ball and pushing. And I was on one side, I think her partner was on the other side. And then there's a midwife. It was a small room in the door jam on her belly with a flashlight. And I was just like, we can, we, we, we need to allow people to find positions that create more space or exactly. at least eliminate like restrictions because pushing uphill against a narrowed space is going to increase tearing is going to make it take longer. It's going to be more stressful for the baby. Like, and so, and, and the data supports that, right? Like the, like it's just, um, lithotomy on your back has just been so in our culture for so long that it's just going to take a lot of us like educating as many people as we can about their options. Right. And knowing like you have an epidural, you chose an epidural, you can still be on your side. You can still have internal yeah. rotation if you want. You can still be on your knees a lot. Most of the time you can be on a lot of, I've had people squatting with a squat bar with an epidural. There's a, I've had, you know, lunges, um, right. You don't just have to narrow the space. Like nothing, not everything is thrown out the window with an epidural. Right? Yeah, for sure. And I literally have like a nurse saying to a woman when she was like, get to this point when she's fully dilated and she was like, oh yeah, you're going to push. Uh, but then she was like, the normal that we see, it's two hours of pushing. And sometimes we see some, sometimes somebody surprise us when they push less, but usually mm -hmm. it's longer. And I'm, I'm standing there like, if this is normal, but it doesn't mean like, it's mean like for me, it's mean like you're doing something like against nature yeah. or against so you kind of creating extra steps that you need to go through instead of like if you get to more optimal position and you use the forces that we like live in then it will be easier and we have a lot of women and myself like experienced pushing shorter it doesn't have to be two hours or even longer that's so true and you know it, it's it's a combination we always say at brm it's a combination of being proactive and reactive so the proactive part is like there's like I said, like different pelvic floors require different strategies. So why not get a pelvic floor that's responsive rather than really, really, really tight prior to the birth? Because I have seen, I don't know if you've seen this, but I've seen epidurals can definitely, and a lot of times slow things down and require an addition of Pitocin and things. But sometimes an epidural actually speeds things up because someone was so just tight in their pelvic floor and it allowed it to relax enough and then they dilate very quickly um, and get to the pushing phase. So I find, um, I kind of went on a tangent there, I guess, but, um, there's a question that I see that is how do we communicate this desire to use less medication to the medical set? Well, that's another thing we didn't talk about. I've seen over the last decade, the ability to ask for the epidural to be turned down during pushing. Have you ever seen that where it's like, okay, let's turn it down so you can feel this a little bit. So you can at least a little bit work with your body's urgent urge sensations 
Yeah, I definitely feel that. And I know like a lot of women, even in Russia, they have this experience, like they, they get an epidural while they're like dilating. And when they get to the pushing, they turn it down. So mm -hmm. they have this ability to push. And even here, when I had like a woman with walking epidural, they was like saying to her, like, you can lower it down. You can feel more so you can, you were able to move. Uh, yeah. More sometimes it depends on the hospital. I guess some hospital will say like, no, this is the medication you're getting. But like, uh, the thing is with the less medication, if you get less opioid um, painkiller and it doesn't, I guess it's still, you still, ha so you still have this benefit of having an epidural, but it's just working a different, different, in a different way. And that's a epidural, it's a cocktail where you can definitely, I think, talk with the anesthesiologist to just change the cocktail for you. In, mo in a lot of hospitals, they really like wanted to give the woman experience that she really want to have. And if it's a, if that's what you want, less medication and feel more, but like b not be in pain and like, then yeah. I'm, I I've seen this happen a lot. I think yeah, it depends on the anesthesiologist. It, unfortunately, you don't know who you're gonna get. Who, yeah, yeah. And sometimes they're like great and amazing, and sometimes they kick they try to kick the duel out for the epidural placement, right? So it's it's kind of um a crapshoot in some ways with that. But I would I would suggest for people if they are planning to birth in a hospital, and even maybe even if they're not, if they're worried about this, like figure it out. Do do they allow that? Like, is that something allow? I hate the word allow, but it can be tricky if you don't know the policies going into a birth at a hospital. I think the other thing that I come up against a lot is how do we advocate for pushing in different positions when someone has an epidural, right? Because as a doula, I'm not just necessarily going to like turn someone by myself. So how do we yeah. like, what's your, like, let's say you're at a birth, someone has an epidural, they're pushing now like a hundred more, not a hundred, but a lot more people come into the room and there's people everywhere and they're like, okay, ready? Take your deep breath. And one, two. And they're, what do, what's the doula do there? And what's the yeah. family do? Like, what's, what do we all do? <laughs> I think it's kind of, it's really good to visualize the whole process before you're going into the labor. So if you can talk with your provider, how it's usually done, or you just with a doula, I try to like uh, visualize what is going to happen. And in my experience, usually when the girl, like they start to push the, First, you have to be on the back and they like with the position and like the check in with the hand placed in the vagina. And they like, they just want to make sure that women understand where she's pushing and how to push. So, this is kind of like the first three contractions that they spent on the back. But then uh, they, the, the, but after that, it's an option to change the position. And I, as soon as they start to push, I tell them like, what do you think? I ask the nurse basically like, what do you think if we're going to move to the side position? She was like, yeah, she could say, yeah, we can try that, but let's do like this push on the back first and then we can do. And then I also always ask like, can we do on hands and knees? Do you think we can facilitate like that position? And sometimes they say like, yeah, I think it's a good position. Let's try it. And sometimes just like, no, I don't feel like it's going to be working. And then they can, it's just the communication, what the nurse is comfortable, I guess, doing what the woman is feeling and just like know what her option is and like in the yeah it's just like a it's a play <laughs> it's really challenging the for room. the doula right and it's challenging so i would like one thing that i think is really important there as a doula is to make sure the family is especially if they're birthing in a hospital just have them know that they also need to advocate for themselves like we teach advocacy sure, yeah. prenatally and we absolutely should advocate for them in this situation as well. Like if somebody doesn't want to push on their back ever and they don't want any vaginal, like they don't want the like push into my finger, which I feel like is really, can be really icky a lot of the times, like the excessive um, like stretching. And I don't think that is stretching. I have not seen that to be beneficial. If anything, mm -hmm. it disrupts things greatly. It's increasing micro trauma to those tissues and i would rather people leave alone what's our our bodies work like innately and they stretch innately and having a provider like like viciously stretching it is really not okay and i've seen some really awful experiences there and i would say like it's a combination we educate them ahead of time i definitely make sure the partner knows that they need to have a voice here and mm -hmm. i will say like that 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 client who back earlier, I said, um, 
the po- provider came in and was like, she needs to be on her back. Otherwise it's hard on my back. I kind of whis- whispered in her ear, hey, so-and-so, your provider will, is requesting you to be on your back. And you, you know, and then I made sure she know, and you're in charge here and you can push in what decision, what position you feel is right. He wasn't saying there was any emergency or any issue. He was just voicing his preference and it's her birth and her preference is the priority. Um, And so she just stayed on her side and pushed her baby out. Um, It's ideal to have a provider that you choose ahead of time and ask them, how do you feel? If I get an epidural, do you need me on my back? What would you, what would you do if I got an epidural? And sometimes they will lip service and say, oh yeah, it's cool. You can be in any position. And sometimes they'll say, which is great if they say this, because then you know you should switch. Oh, if you're on your back, if you give an epidural, we really like you on your back, right? And then you can say, interesting, why? Right? Ask them why. Why do you want me on my back? Like, what's the, what's the reason? And that guy, he just told me, and I was like, thank your lucky stars if they tell you these things prior to the birth, because that's just revealed to you a lack of alignment between what you want and what your provider is willing to deliver, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah. But I feel like if you have an epidural, it's kind of more, more presence of the like medical stuff too. And sometimes they will just find the reason to keep you on the back. But if women have this, like if my client have this a bit like, um, uh have this willing to be on different side i will definitely support them even though if they will kind of like weather in me but i will still like keep asking like can we still can we change or do you think we can do this or let's just move and just keep trying to give you the option and just see how at it the works. end of the day though they get to decide right if someone decides exactly. the doula says hey would you like to be on your side or would you be interested in this not overly like we're not gonna like like keep forcing what we because we it doesn't matter what we want it's their birth if they choose after knowing all that we've educated them prenatally if they've you know and they still stayed with this provider which that's their choice and I don't judge them for that like I'm not them no judgment from this doula like there's no ego it's like you birth how you want here's the information here's what you chose now we're at the birth I'm going to give you your information I'm going to advocate and remind you of your wishes and at the end of the day if you still choose to be on your back and you decide that what they say is what you want. Like, I'm going to support that. Yeah, I'm supporting I might that. put yeah, some little, sure. right? I might put some little rolls, you know, the BRM tricks. Like, I might put a little, some rolls under your back. I might see if we can, like, put the knees less out, yeah. right? Like, we can, even if, so that's the other thing. Like, we're not, for as a doula, I'm not forcing anyone into positions. And actually, sometimes I, honestly, people think Lindsay's, like, constantly just, like, moving people. No. Oh, I give them options, of course, especially prenatally. And then I, like, I trust this process. And again, if they have an epidural, they can't intuitively find movements anymore. So I will help them like, like move their body in different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, like you, ha- everyone has to be responsible for their own experience. Right. And yeah. as doulas, we're like the tour guides or the trip sitters, whatever you want to call us. But it's their birth and we are here to, to honor and, and respect that. Yeah. Okay. And I also like to do one, like in between the contraction when they're resting to do some releases, because even mm, though they are on the side, we can, we can do like sacred tubulus, sacred tubulus release or yes. like obturate. Yeah. I, I, I know all the like... weird words. Obturator and turnus. I know that's my favorite. Obtur- yeah. 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 Also do some, just the movements when she's resting. So it's a lot of things we still can do, even though we have an epidural. Yeah. So it's like, it's like physiological birth, like powered by the human innate capacity. Like that's like nothing on board. Right. Then it's like, there's this place of like, okay, we're getting some medical support, but that doesn't mean that the physiological support and awareness for the pro goes out the window. So yeah, I love that. As a B- as a BRM pro and as a doula, you can release different things. You're like, okay, where is the baby? Are they in the mid pelvis? Are they in the outlet? Okay. Now I know because they're like, if there's a delay, I know what it could be. Like for, for that one um, client of mine, remember it was like the shoulder. So we needed to do some of that for other people. Like you said, it's a sacred tuberous or the the um, obturator internus. And sometimes we can tell that based on, as you know, what, what, what we assess in their body prenatally, right? Oh, here's another question. Yeah. Let's see it. And then we'll keep, um, 
what I hear often is they want a laboring woman on her back with her legs wide open because it widens the pelvis most. So let me say before I turn to you, I I have I have a lot of I have some insider information that pelvic biomechanics is not a covered topic in medical school and I don't think it's in midwifery school either and I we're hoping to change that and there is a lot that we're still of course learning and I think we're kind of on the forefront of this but I believe that we need to like bring this work to the to the medical staff because <laughs> it is yeah. Like I can show you exactly why it's not, <laughs> right? Exactly. Like as you take the hips into external rotation, you narrow the space from side to side. And so I think having more doulas, midwives, doctors, nurses, yoga teachers, OTs, P, everyone, having people all actually understand the pelvic biomechanics and even teaching it to the families, right? Like we can show it. We can show this bone it's connected to this bone via soft tissue. So if you take this bone and you pull it to the side, it's gonna pull something with it, which is this bone, and then it's gonna narrow. The one thing that they get right on lithotomy on the back is the deep hip flexion, right? They're pulling the knees in towards the body, which is gonna pull the sits bone along for the ride. But then we have the situation that the sacrum is against a bed, right? So it's not that babies, and here's the deal. Like, I don't think every buddy should be in like the most outlet open position, right? Do we always need to internally rotate the femurs and reach up? We allow the like per birthing person to, you know, move intuitively. And then we instruct if there's a delay and if we need more space, right? Because I've seen people overly instruct the internal hip rotation to someone who doesn't actually have internal hip rotation because they haven't, you know, they didn't prepare it in pregnancy and cause injury. Right. So we shouldn't be forcing these deep, extreme motions, especially during an epidural where someone not can't feeling, feel yeah. to tell us. Yeah. 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 I definitely feel like I even have the woman she was pushing and then we were trying to use the different position. But the nurse keep giving, keep bringing her leg into this position yeah. and keep saying, like, I want you, I want your pelvis to be open. Let's just keep this legs up and like be in the back i'm like this is not the time when i wanted to like tell you exactly. that this is not the position for opening the pelvis at this time but like we can't <laughs> yeah and and the thing is we can't fight we don't our clients don't want us to fight through their birth that's exactly that's yeah. inappropriate but they do that's why educating the family right and like my one of my missions is educate all the pros because if all the pros eventually get what's going on in the pelvis with e each different movement, it's gonna shift things. And I see, I see a lot of people doing great work in the world, you and all these other people, like just putting it out there of like, here's the way. And, and you know, there's different Instagram accounts and different things and you, you know, there's people doing great work. And hopefully as we all continue to like push this work into the world that those who are not on board are gonna realize like, hey, there's, there's a, better a lot, way. Of, lot more yeah and yeah. that's the thing about your instagram account and your like body ready method that i'm part of it it's when i i firstly saw your account and i saw all this like a uh, movement that you do with the pelvis and showing and for me i was like oh wow this is what is actually happening and i really wanted to know like why i have to be in this position what's yeah. changing if i be in the other position and how can i help us just all this knowledge it's a science and it's really makes a huge difference it's just sending my brain into like what I need to do like what what next can I do or what wh why I have to do this so it's, it's really great and I feel like especially the medical personnel who it's studying it should be talking or should know about this birth biomechanics and like should be focusing on like up-to-date study and research not just like use the whatever was told like hundreds of years ago and just no. can keep continue it. But like we are here, have so many knowledge and like so many new information that we can help to have easier labor, not to just stay within like a norm, hospital norm, and we're not going to do anything. It's all, it's just, let's just keep pushing for like an amount, like an, an amount of hours and going to be done with it. I mean, no, and we tear have more and get, oh yeah, I know. Like yeah. mic drop. That was the perfect, like, we are all in this together. If you're a pro, like, no, like there is lots of us, lots of people helping to help try to shift this paradigm in the world. 
if you're a family, like if you're uh, listening and you're pregnant and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. How am I going to advocate? Get a doula, start educating yourself. No. And I think, uh, you know, what I like to tell people is standing up for yourself and supporting yourself. Now you're going to have to do it for the next 18 years. I almost have an age exactly. longer. I just haven't got past 18 yet. My oldest is 17, but like people are going to have an opinion about what you do for the rest of your life with your child, how you feed them, the school they go to or don't, you know, everything. They're gonna have an opinion on your birth too. And you're gonna have to learn how to advocate for yourself. You know, your kid gets sick, they go to the hospital. You have to know how to advocate, not just follow what, you know, exactly. their medical, you know, they have medical training, but they don't have superpowers, right? They don't know. I think sometimes we put providers on pedestals and they are have special training and absolutely thank God for them. But they, they, we have inside information about our own bodies and our own experience. And that's just as important and valuable. So. And all the time I'll, I'll keep saying to my woman, you are the reason why we're all here and you are making the decision. So it's up exactly. to you how you want to continue. Like it's not the medical provider or me or anybody else. It's you and your baby. It's matter. So just exactly. keep focusing on what you want and I will support you and everybody else will support you because you, we, we, we came here to help you to have a baby. Mm, that's so good. And that's how we make people enter into parenthood with empowerment. And if we can help people to enter through um, this experience, feeling good about themselves and feeling empowered rather than broken and traumatized, like think how that can just shift the world, yeah. right? Empower yeah. people, empower people. And they can't, you know, it's just, it just goes on and on. So the, the cheesy like peace on earth begins at birth. I deeply believe that. And I believe like power, part of what we're doing is, you know, shifting things. So thank you, Olga, for being a game changer and a, a shifter. Um, everyone go follow Olga. She does great work in Boston. And um, this was great. And we'll see you all next time. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.